Hi, I'm Aaron Hylers, and I'm the project manager for the Blanchard River Demonstration Farms. The Demonstration Farms is a five-year initiative showcasing and demonstrating conservation practices that will help improve agricultural's impact on downstream water quality. The question that I'm asked most often is what are you learning on the demonstration farms? The science is now starting to coalesce around three main principles or recommendations. The first set of recommendations revolves around the four R's of nutrient management, which are applying nutrients from the right source, at the right rate, at the right time, and in the right place. To meet the first two four R's of source and rate, you must first know what's in your soil already. Soil testing is the most basic and most important practice a farmer can implement. How do you know how many nutrients to apply if you don't know what's in your soil already? To do this, there are a few different methods of sampling. The first is taking one sample for every 25 acres. The second is breaking the field into two and a half acre grids and sampling each grid. Or third, looking at past crop yield data, soil types, and topography to create zones in the field. Each zone is then sampled separately. On the demonstration farms, we wanted to compare the differences between sampling methods. Our local agronomist pulled soil samples for each method on the same day and sent them to the same lab. When comparing the MAP fertilizer recommendation column, which is the source where we get our phosphorus from commercial fertilizer, you can see the standard whole field sample recommended applying 200 pounds per acre. The grid sample recommended 95 pounds per acre, and the zone sample 58 pounds per acre. In this instance, the farmer could save almost 8,600 pounds of fertilizer from even being applied and the fertilizer that he did apply is going to be placed in areas of the fields that need it most. This is an economical savings to the farmer, as well as an environmental savings. By increasing the level of intensity of soil sampling and utilizing data collected from the farm throughout the year, farmers can make an immediate impact. The third 4R is applying nutrients at the right time. It may seem like a common sense concept, don't apply nutrients when there is a strong chance of measurable precipitation in the forecast. The research backs this up. As seen here with edge of field data, there is a greater potential for nutrient losses when application is followed shortly by precipitation. The brighter colors, reds and oranges, indicate more loss of total phosphorus from the drainage tile. But how often can you count on the weather forecast to be right? It seems in recent years that we are getting more frequent, intense rain events. The Bowling Green National Weather Service site has been collecting rainfall data for over 100 years. The information from this site is bearing out what anecdotally we see. Rainfall patterns have continued to change over the course of the century. The overall number of one inch or greater rainfall events has trended up over the last 30 years. The large rain events, which are characterized as being two inches or greater in a 24-hour period, have also increased dramatically. The timing of this rainfall has also shifted into the early spring, which impacts agricultural operations. These large, intense rainfall events are driving nutrients downstream. According to researchers, 70 to 90 percent of the phosphorus contribution into Lake Erie occurs during about 10 rain events throughout the year. This is what those type of rainfall events look like on our demonstration farms. The question is, what can we do to make our farms more resilient to these events? We may be doing everything right and have it all washed away in a matter of a few hours. The final 4R is the placement of nutrients. Research shows that we can have a drastic reduction, up to 70%, of dissolved reactive phosphorus when those nutrients are injected or tilled into the soil instead of spread on top of the soil and left exposed to the weather. 
But how do we do this efficiently and economically? Our demonstration farmers have implemented a few methods of doing this. The first is Kellogg Farms. Here they are doing strip tillage, in which the fertilizer is being carried in the bin behind the toolbar and is blown through the tubes and mixed into the soil in nine inch wide strips. The crop is then planted into this band using GPS. This toolbar and associated equipment cost approximately $250,000. That dollar amount isn't feasible for smaller farms. However, for a producer the size of the Kellogg's, they can spread that cost out on more acres. They have also found that they can use less fertilizer because the nutrient is placed in a band where the crop can use it more efficiently. If you are a farmer that cannot implement a management change like strip tillage, there may be other methods available. This toolbar may be a better fit for the farmer who does not want to disturb the soil. Here it is placing fertilizer below ground using a single disc opener, doing much less disturbance while accomplishing the same task. The final subsurface placement tool is for manure. Here the statelers are applying liquid swine manure below the soil surface. This will help reduce odors from the manure application and protect the manure from heavy rainfall events. This method of applying manure will be tested at the edge of field sites versus a surface application of manure beginning in 2019. To the non-farmer, they may question why nutrients are broadcast on top of the ground in the first place. It is more efficient and can be done for about $5 per acre. When we start doing practices like injection or strip tillage, it takes more time to cover the same amount of acres, and it currently costs $30 to $35 per acre. In tough economic times, every dollar is crucial. The second recommendation is to have a water management plan for every field. Nutrients predominantly leave with the water from a field. If water doesn't leave a field, nutrients won't leave a field. There are a variety of practices that fall into this category of stopping, slowing down, or treating water before it leaves the field. The first practice is drainage water management. A drainage water management structure is seen here, the box that is sitting on top of the drainage tile. Here is a view looking inside the structure at the drainage water flowing through the tile system. According to Edge of Field research, we lose about 70% of our drainage water through the non-growing season, which is approximately October through April. This water takes about 70% of the phosphorus with it. But what if we could reduce this flow during periods of the year when we didn't need free-flowing drainage? This can be accomplished by managing the boards within this structure. When the farmer is ready to do field work in the spring, he removes the boards, allowing the soil profile to completely drain. After spring work, the farmer sets the boards to a height about 18 inches below the soil surface. This holds back most drainage water, but allows for a safety valve if there is a large rain event. That water could rise over the top board and continue downstream. When the farmer is ready for fall harvest, he removes the boards again. Once fall field work is completed, the farmer sets the boards until the following spring. By manipulating the height of the water table in the soil profile, you are essentially acting as if the tile isn't there. The water continues to drain down through the soil profile past the field tile. By restricting the flow throughout portions of the year, research has shown about a 50% reduction in nutrient loss. Drainage water management can also have a secondary benefit of increased crop yields during a dry year as crops' roots can benefit from the extra water stored in the soil. Another practice that can be used to manage water is a blind inlet. Typically, in low-lying areas of the field where water ponds, a tile riser like this is installed to remove excess water because this can reduce crop yields. The soil can bind nutrients as water moves through the soil profile. 
However, these risers allow water to bypass the soil and are direct conduits to drainage ditches. By removing these risers and replacing them with a blind inlet, we can break that direct connection. The blind inlet, as seen here, is a web of PVC pipe with holes in it. It is placed at the bottom of the hole and backfilled with gravel and geotextile fabric. The remaining portion of the hole is graded level with the field with a sand type media. This engineered practice is designed to remove the surface water in 24 to 36 hours, but forces the water through the different layers of media. This can have a drastic reduction in nutrient and sediment loading. Specifically, in this research by USDA Agricultural Research Service, a 64% and 72% reduction in dissolved reactive phosphorus. As we move into the in-stream practices we can implement to manage water, we start with the two-stage channel. A traditional drainage channel is trapezoidal in shape. It is designed to move water away from the crop field quickly to reduce crop loss. However, these channels sometimes aren't designed large enough, and the water in the ditch either flows at a high velocity or jumps out of the banks, creating flooding issues or bank scouring which leads to delivering high amounts of sediment and nutrients downstream. A two-stage channel is an engineered practice that is designed to handle these situations. As you can see, the first stage is where the water flows during normal conditions. The second stage is the created portion of this ditch. This area acts as a floodplain, allowing water to spread out during high flow events. When water spreads out, it slows down and drops out sediment and the nutrients attached to it. This system is also designed to contain most flows inside the channel and not have flooding issues within the field. The Kurt Demonstration Farm installed a two-stage channel in conjunction with the Hardin County Soil and Water Conservation District and the Nature Conservancy. One of the other benefits of a two-stage channel is the reduction in maintenance once established. The oldest ditch currently installed is over 20 years old and hasn't had to be cleaned out to date. The next practice can benefit the farm from both the water management aspect as well as keeping soil in place. Cover crops are plants that are planted after the main cash crops of corn, soybeans, or wheat. The goal of cover crops is to keep living roots in the soil and vegetation on top of the ground throughout the year as much as possible. These roots can hold the soil in place, bind nutrients, and increase organic matter in the soil, which absorbs more water. This is a pretty typical scene across Ohio after rainfall or snow melt in the winter months. However, the difference here is that the water flowing down the side ditch appears clean. It's flowing off a field with cover crops on it. The other water coming down a different side ditch is sediment laden. It's coming from a field that is not cover cropped. Having cover on a field as much as possible can be a tremendous benefit to sediment loss. But what about nutrient loss? Preliminary data from a few edge of field sites gives us some insight into this. The first site is corn and cereal rye was aerial applied to one field in August and not applied to the paired field. The blue line represents nitrate loss from those fields throughout the year. Researchers saw a 90% reduction in nitrate loss from the field that had a cover crop on it. They saw no statistical difference in the amount of dissolved reactive phosphorus that left those two fields. The second site shows a treatment of dairy manure being applied at different rates on a mustard cover crop. Again, there is a significant reduction in nitrate loss, but no difference in dissolved reactive phosphorus loss. One note of interest, however, is that the field that had cover crops on it did show two inches less water leaving the field. This can be a crucial element in the importance cover crops can play in improving water quality. Again, this is preliminary work and will continue to be studied, but it is important to remember 
that the practices that we select for our farms must be implemented to solve the problem that we are trying to correct. The final practice to discuss is one that can help treat drainage water that leaves your field. What do you do if you have a field that has extremely high soil test phosphorus? Remember, soil test phosphorus isn't directly correlated to high losses of phosphorus downstream, but it can increase the likelihood of loss. These fields are called legacy phosphorus fields because they may have received high rates of nutrients decades ago, and the levels remain high because crops can only uptake so many nutrients annually. This graph shows work done at Oklahoma State University on this issue. These fields range from 100 parts per million soil test phosphorus to 600 parts per million, while the recommended levels are around 40 parts per million. No additional applications of phosphorus occurred on these fields after 1998, and after 20 years, the soil test levels remained well above recommended levels. This is where a phosphorus removal structure can potentially play a role. These removal structures come in many different shapes and sizes. There are surface flumes, tile cartridges, and underground systems. These structures are filled with phosphorus sorption material, like steel slag and drinking water treatment residuals, among others. These materials have a high affinity to bind nutrients, particularly phosphorus. On our demonstration farms, we installed a few different structures, including this one on the Kurt farm. You can see before construction, the two-stage ditch at the bottom of the picture and the crop field at the top. This is a tile treatment. Researchers removed the tile in the filter strip and created an approximately two and a half foot deep hole. At the bottom of this hole, they installed PVC piping, much like the blind inlet. They installed steel slag on top of this PVC pipe and installed another layer of piping on top of the slag material. This PVC is then reconnected to the field tile through a drainage water management structure. This creates a top-down flow-through system. Water comes in through the top PVC piping, is forced down through the slag material until it reaches the bottom PVC layer and then flows freely to the ditch. The research is promising that it can remove the necessary amounts of dissolved reactive phosphorus, as shown here in this work from one of the edge of field sites. However, how long can these systems last and how much will they cost the farmer are questions yet to be fully answered. The recommendations of following the 4R approach of nutrient management Developing a water management plan for every field and reducing soil erosion are practical things farmers can do to help minimize nutrient losses. More is to be learned about the true impact these practices can have on downstream water quality and their impact on farmers' economic bottom line. But if every producer can follow these guidelines, we are moving in the right direction. Depending on the situation, most farmers apply a range of 50 to 150 pounds of phosphorus fertilizer to meet their agronomic goals. The Edge of Field Monitoring Network is showing that, on average, agriculture is losing about one pound per acre of that phosphorus downstream. That one pound fits into this mason jar. We also know that we are being asked to reduce that amount by 40%, or about half of this jar. Phosphorus fertilizer currently costs about 50 cents per pound, and we are being asked to save about 25 cents worth of nutrients from going downstream. The practices that may accomplish this task can cost 20 to $40 per acre, or the piece of equipment can cost $250,000. This is not an excuse that we can't do things better. However, this is the challenge that agriculture is facing to meet the public's expectations. As farmers, I ask that you visualize your individual operation and begin to think about how you can apply these principles. You may be doing some already, and some may be a challenge for your landscape. Visit with your local soil and water conservation district 
and Natural Resource Conservation Service professionals, as they can assist you with technical assistance and potentially cost share dollars as you make changes on your farm. You can also visit our website at blancharddemofarms.org for videos, fact sheets, and upcoming field days and tour opportunities so you can learn more about the science behind the conservation practices. Thank you.